I would now like to welcome to the stage Fleming Rose, who is a Danish journalist. He published the Mohammed cartoons, very controversial, as I'm sure you all remember. He also has written a book about free speech, and the title of his book is The Tyranny of Silence. Fleming. Well, um, I'm first going to introduce uh, a keynote speech by the French minister, uh, Malin Schiappa, uh, who is a minister for citizenship, and that will be the keynote and introduction to the panel uh, that we are going to join afterwards. Please. Yes. I'm very happy to take part in the Copenhagen Democracy Summit 2021, in particular in this discussion of freedom of expression. I am in good company with admirable personalities. Let me begin by greeting them all very warmly. I thank you for paying tribute to the memory of Samuel Petit. Merci. I remember with emotion that day when this young teacher was brutally murdered by an Islamic terrorist. With the president and the minister, Gérald Darmanin, we were among the first to go to the scene immediately after the tragedy. We discovered then the personality of Samuel Betty, an everyday hero, committed to his work of transmitting the idols of the Republic, a teacher who listened to his students, open to otherness and to foreigners, drawn despite himself into the tragedy of history. We own him the tribute of French Republic. For a long time, the main threat to freedom of expression was the state. Let us be honest, it continues sometimes to be the state in many countries of the world. Wherever democracy has failed to take root, it is the state that centrals that suffocates dissident voices, that sends opponents to present colonies or labor camps. It is a state that sometimes murdered journalists. But in the free world, in countries like France or Denmark, the greatest threat no longer comes from the state. It comes from society. The greatest threat is represented by ideologists and fanatized groups who claim to be orphaned by opinions different from their own and who want to censor them or even make their others disappear. The most dangerous of these enemies of freedom of expression remain the Islamists. And I don't confuse Islamists and Muslims. I'll develop this further later. Islamists are not satisfied with insulting and intimidating. They use violence and punish with death those who dare to criticize them. In France, the Islamists decimated the staff of Charlie Hebdo. Because of them, many journalists are under protection, sometimes for many years, and teachers in some territories are forced to censor themselves. But let us beware of other enemies of freedom of expression. They do not slit throats. They do not be hid, but they threaten. They hurl anathemas, invectives, they spread fear to impose censorship and erase those who dislike. They do not always kill us, but they kill our freedom of speech. They are, first of all, all those who, without being Islamists themselves, find that cartoonists, Charlie Hebdo or Samuel Paty, have gone too far and had it coming. They believe that Islamists should not be provoked and that it is safer not to criticize the political instrumentalization of religion. Those suggest, through the concept of Islamophobia, that criticizing political Islamism necessarily means hating Muslims. They are often people who see in Muslims a sort of new proletariat, but these new bigots are the useful idiots of Islamism. But hostility to free speech can come from other forms of political radicalization. Once a group is convinced of the moral superiority of its cause, it is entitled to silence those who do not think in the same way. 
This is what is currently happening with the cancel culture that is developing in American campuses, but also in Europe, particularly in France. We no longer count the number of debates in our university that could not take place because militant groups have decided that its participants did not have the right to express themselves. This cancel culture is harassed by the fragmentation of society into communities based on origin, skin color, religion, gender, or sexual orientation. Social networks, which link us together in groups of friends or, and expose us less and less to otherness, amplify this entre soi and this intolerance to debate and freedom of expression. Is it a fatality? Is a country like France, with its long tradition of religious caricature, for example, condemned to give it up? I don't think so. We must resist this wave at all costs. It is very strong, but our elders in this 20th century had to face challenges of a different gravity. We must remind that new generations of the benefits of freedom of expression. It is through debate, the confrontation of point of views, that we come closer to the truth, that we correct our mistakes, that we expose injustices and make our society move forward. No individual, no group, has the whole truth by itself. To repress freedom of expression is to deprive humanity to progress. We must also remind the new generations that freedom of expression, as Voltaire wrote, is the basis of all other freedoms. Remove it prevents people from speaking as they wish. You can then cancel all other freedoms without difficulty, since there will not be no one to protest. This is how totalitarian experiments begin. Without freedom of speech, there is no free nation. The French government, as you know, is not prepared to compromise with the attack on freedom of expression. It is determined to protect his fundamental rights. This is what it is doing through the bill currently before Parliament, which aims to threaten respect of the principle of the Republic. This law provides new tools to fight against the entry of enemies of democracy freedoms into various sectors of society. It will make it possible to better combat the infiltration of associations or place of worship by radical movements. The fight against the propagation of their discourse in the internet to prevent them from controlling schools. We must not be naive. We must see limits to the tolerance of democratic societies towards individual or forces that want their destruction. This is what we are doing. Our actions are sometimes criticized, especially in certain American media. Criticism is healthy, it is normal. But in this case, I think it is not always justified. They would have us believe, what nonsense, that we are taking measures that are hostile to our own Muslim compatriots. This is not true. What we fight, everyone knows it well, is radical Islamism. In other words, a political ideology with totalitarian character, which declared war on democracy. And the Muslims, who in their immense majority live their religion peacefully, are the first victims of ideology in the world. May I point that many countries with a Muslim majority are themselves trying to protect their inhabitants against the radical Islamism, and that they have often been fighting it for longer than we have, and even more forcefully? Let us not confuse a religion with a political ideology that seeks to instrumentalize it, and that divides it from its principles. The Islamists maintain that confusion. They would like to make people believe that we are fighting Islam to provoke a clash of civilization, as they say. It is surprising that some people follow their lead and try to see racism in measures aimed to protecting us from Islamic radicalism. There is a lot of blindness and compromise in this attitude, a form of betrayal of liberal values. But this is not so surprising let us think of the blindness of a part of that intellectuals towards Stalinism or fascism in the 20th century. Let's be clear, racism 
unfortunately exists, especially against Muslims. And this culture of racial hatred does not spare any countries. It does not spare France, the country with one of the largest population of Muslim faith or culture in Europe. We are fighting this culture of racism with great determination. We sanction it. France has one of the most restrictive laws in Europe against hateful speech targeting minorities based on their race, ethnic origin or sexuality. It is one of the few countries to have adopted memory laws that penalize the denial of genocide and crimes against humanity. It has a state administration directly attached to the prime minister in charge of fighting against racism, anti-Semitism and anti-LGBTQ hate. This institution supports hundreds of associations, trained police officers as well as magistrates. A national network of instigators and magistrates specialized in all forms of racism has been created. Millions of euros are spent each year to secure sensitive areas. National education is not left out and has made the fight against racism a priority subject for mobilization. But it is racism, which must be formed with energy, have nothing to do with the criticism of radical Islamism, which is necessary. Racism must be condemned, but we must not create a crime of blasphemy. It is not allowed to call for hatred or discriminations against religious groups, but it is allowed to criticize belief systems or philosophical conceptions. In a conclusion, a word about women's rights. I am, above all, as you know, a feminist activist. This is how I entered politics in my country. I know the importance of freedom of expression for the cause of women. Everything starts with the liberation of the world. Dare to say, dare to ask, dare to demand, dare to be here, dare to rebel. Freedom of expression and women's rights are inseparable. And it is no coincidence that those who hate our society of freedom are primarily attacking both women and those who embody freedom of expression, such as journalists and teachers. Women must not forget this and always be at the forefront of this fight for freedom of expression. Count on me in any case. Thank you very much. Mm.